Hello everyone. Welcome back to session 3 of chapter 2 called Sexual Reproduction in Flowering Plants. Before I move on to this session 3, what did we learn in session 2 of this chapter called Sexual Reproduction in Flowering Plants? We learnt about androsium, the male reproductive structure of a flower which consists of stamens and we learnt about the structure of a typical stamen, then we learnt about the structure of a microsporangium, then we learnt about the structure of a pollen grain. Now what are we going to study in the session 3 of this chapter 2 called sexual reproduction in flowering plants? We will be studying about a very important reproductive structure that is gynosium. Then we will be studying about the structure of ovule. Then we will be studying about megasporogenesis. Then we will be studying about outbreeding devices. Then we will be dealing with the pollination. So moving on to the session 3 of this chapter called sexual reproduction. I think all of us know gynosium. What is gynosium children? Gynosium is the female reproductive structure of a flower which consists of three very important parts that is stigma, style and ovary. So what is gynosium? Gynosium is otherwise called pistil and it consists of three very important parts called stigma, style and ovary. Also containing ovules. The ovary contains what? The ovules, right? Now, as I said, this gynosium is made up of units called carpels. There, the stamens were the units for androsium, whereas the units for gynosium is called carpels. And here, let us study about some terms and terminologies. I think all this you have studied in first PUC, right? So, when the gynosium is made up of a single carpel, it is called monocarpillary, right? When a gynosium or a pistil is made up of more than two carpels, it is called multicarpillary. What are carpels? Carpels are nothing but the units of gynosium. What do you mean by apocarpus? When the carpels are free, they are not fused, then we use a specific term called apocarpus, right? Moving on to the other word called syncarpus. What do you mean by syncarpus? When the carpels are fused, they are not free. When they are free, the condition is called apocarpus. When the carpels are fused, we use a word called syncarpus, right? What is the example for monocarpillary gynosium then? You can give an example of wheat, paddy and mango. So monocarpillary means what? A gynosium or a pistil having a single carpel. So what is multicarpillary? Having more than two carpels. What is apocarpus? When the carpels are free, you use the word called apocarpus. When the carpels are fused, we use the word called syncarpus. Right. And monocarpillary, as I said, gynosium or a pistil containing only one carpel. Classical example is pea, wheat, paddy and mango. What is bicarpillary then? When the gynosium or the pistil contains two carpels, we use the word called bicarpillary. Hope you have understood this concept. So based on the number of carpels, we classify gynosium into monocarpillary when the carpels are one, only one carpel is present. Multicarpillary when the carpels are more than two carpels. Then apocarpus when the carpels are free. Then syncarpus, when the carpels are fused, we use the word called syncarpus. Monocarpillary gynosium examples are pea wheat, paddy and mango. Bicarpillary gynosium, what do you mean by bicarpillary gynosium? When the gynosium consists of two carpels, it is called bicarpillary. Syncarpus means what again? When the carpels are fused, two in number but they are fused. Moving on to the next word called tricarpillary gynosium. What do you mean by tricarpillary gynosium? When the gynosium consists of three carpels. When the gynosium consists of three carpels, it is called tricarpillary gynosium, but it is fused. When the carpels are fused, they are not free, we use the word called syncarpus. What is the example? Monocots. Moving on to pentacarpillary, more than five carpels. So when a gynosium consists of five carpels, but they are fused, you call it as pentacarpillary syncarpus gynosium. Example is hibiscus. Then multicarpillary syncarpus. That is apocarpus, multicarpillary, more than two carpels, syncarpus, right? That is mycelia. Actually, it is 
Apocarpus that is Mycelia. Here you can see in the diagram Mycelia. This is the example of Mycelia. This is the example of Monocot, Hibiscus, then the Papaver. What is the example for multicarpillary Syncarpus gynosium? It is Papaver, right? I repeat. So, tricarpillary gynos, syncarpus gynosium, that is when the carpels are three and they are fused. Pentacarpillary syncarpus gynosium, when the carpels are five in number but they are fused. You use the word called pentacarpillary syncarpus gynosium. Multicarpillary apocarpus, not syncarpus, it is apocarpus, it is mycelia. Then multicarpillary syncarpus gynosium is, example is papaver. So, all this is based on the number of Carpels, we classify the gynosium into monocarpillary, bicarpillary, tricarpillary, pentacarpillary and multicarpillary. Now, moving on to the structure of megasporangium. There, the pollen grain was called microsporangium. That is, the anther was called microsporangium. Here, the ovule is called the megasporangium. So, here you can see the picture. It is of what? It is of a typical a dissected flower of hibiscus showing pistil. As I said, a typical hibiscus consists of, it is a bisexual flower. And as I said, a gynosium consists of what? Consists of three parts, stigma, style and ovary. And this is the thalamus which holds the other whorls of a flower. And this is a picture of a second one that is multicarpillary syncarpus of that is papaver. And this is multicarpillary apocarpus mycelia. This is the picture of what? Multicarpillary apocarpus mycelia. And this is the picture of a multicarpillary syncarpus pistil of papaver. Right. So this is C and this is B. Right. So, what is this? This is the picture of what? A dissected flower of hibiscus showing pistil or gynosium which consists of three parts that is stigma, style and ovary. Right. And this is the second one is the picture of multicarpillary apocarpus mycelia. I already I told you what is multicarpillary? More than three carpels. Apocarpus when the carpels are not fused, they are free, we use the word called multicarpillary apocarpus. Then the last one is a picture of what you can see this is the picture where the carpels are free, alright. So that is multicarpillary syncarpus. Then moving on to the last picture here, this is the picture of a anatropus ovule. Now let us study what is the structure of an anatropus ovule. So anatropus ovule is a type of ovule where the funicle is bent upon itself. The funicle is bent upon itself and the micropyle facing the placenta and usually the ovule might be unitegmic or bitegmic. What do you mean by unitegmic? That is unitegmic or bitegmic that is one layered or two layered. So this is a picture of a typical ovule. Ovule is otherwise called megasporangium and this is the picture of an anatropus ovule. What is anatropus ovule? The funicle is bent upon itself and the micropyle is facing the placenta and the ovule may be unitegmic or bitegmic that is one layered or it might be two layered and this ovule is an integmented megasporangium. What is ovule? Ovule is an integmented megasporangium located within the ovary. Ovule is within the ovary. I told you in the beginning that is gynosium is a female reproductive structure which consists of style, stigma and ovary containing ovules, right? And ovule is nothing but an integmented megasporangium located within the ovary. And what is an ovule consisting of? Ovule consists of embryo sac, Nucellus and integments. You can see here the two integments. And after fertilization, this ovule will develop into what? It will develop into seed. I repeat, this ovule is an integmented. What do you mean by integmented? Layers. Integmented megasporangium located within the ovary. Right. And it consists of what? Three very important parts. Nucellus, embryo sac and integments. After fertilization, what is the ovule developing into? The ovule is developing into seed, right? And here you can see that the ovule is attached to the placenta by means of a stalk-like structure called funicle. 
the ovule is attached to the placenta by means of a stalk called funicle, right? You can see here the funicle and the body of the ovule fuses with the funicle at a particular region called, this region can you see? This is called helum. I repeat, the ovule is attached to the placenta by means of a stalk called funicle, right? And the body of the ovule fuses with the funicle at a particular region called what do you call it as helum, right? And usually we find that the ovule consists of two envelopes and we call the two envelopes as integuments, right? What are the two integuments? Outer integument and inner integument. That is each ovule, a typical ovule consists of one or two envelopes which we use the word called integuments, layers, right? And this integuments encircle the ovule except at the tip, except at this tip region. So the integument is going to encircle the whole ovule except at one particular region that is at the tip where you find a small opening called micropyle. Here you can see here, you can find a micropyle, right? And opposite to the micropyle is the chalagel region. So you, and this forms the base of the ovule. This forms the base of the ovule, right? Now, very important is about the nucellus. What is nucellus? Nucellus is nothing but a nourishing tissue formed between the embryo sac and the integuments. So what is nucellus? Nucellus is nothing but a nourishing tissue that is formed between the embryo sac and the integument. You can see here the nucellus is nothing but a sporogenous tissue which is formed between the embryo sac and the what? The integuments and the cells of the nucellus contain abundant reserve food material, right? And this nucellus contains what? Abundant reserve food material, right? And very important is you can see the embryo sac. The embryo sac is located within the nucellus. So here you can see this part is called as the embryo sac which is located within the nucellus. And typical angiosperm plant or a typical ovule will have only single uh, megaspore which is developed from the megaspore mother cell through meiotic cell division. So how is the embryo sac formed? A typical ovule is formed, uh, will have only a single embryo sac formed from megaspore mother cell which is formed due to meiotic division which is uh, all of you know meiotic division is nothing but a reductional cell division. So this is all about the study of a ovule. This is very very important uh, from examination point of view because this might be asked for 5 marks question. Explain with a neat label diagram the structure of a typical anatropous ovule, right? Next, moving on to a very important uh, process that is development of female gametophyte which is otherwise called megasporogenesis. Which is otherwise called megasporogenesis. Here you can see it is called megasporogenesis. I told you a typical ovule will contain single megaspore which is developed from what? It is developed from megaspore mother cell through meiosis which is nothing but a reductional division. So here the diploid MMC, MMC is what? Megaspore mother cell. This is always diploid. Here you can see the diploid megaspore mother cell will undergo meiosis. Right? Am I clear children? So the megaspore mother cell will, which is a diploid cell will undergo what? Meiotic division to form four cells. To form four cells, four daughter cells. Here how many are formed? Four daughter cells. So here first two, then again two into four. Right. So the megaspore first step is what? The diploid megaspore mother cell will undergo meiotic division to form what? Four daughter cells. To form four daughter cells. Among the four daughter cells, among the four daughter cells, three cells will degenerate. So four cells are formed at the end of meiotic division. Among the four, three cells, these are called as degenerating cells. These are called degenerating cells, right? And this is called the functional megaspore. This is called functional megaspore. I repeat, 
the deployed MMC that is megaspore mother cell will undergo meiotic division to form what? How many? Four daughter cells. Here you can see the four daughter cells. Among the four daughter cells, three cells will degenerate, will, which will become non-functional. So the only one megaspore will be functional. Am I clear? Now, this functional megaspore will undergo first mitotic division. There it was meiotic division. Here it is mitotic division. You have to remember. So the functional megaspore, the only one megaspore which is functional will undergo first mitotic division to produce two nuclei. Can you see here? And the two nuclei are moving to the opposite poles and this stage is called two nucleate stage. This Megasporogenesis is very, very important from examination point of view. The diagram as well as the explanation is quite commonly asked for five marks question children. So the concepts what you study here is very, very important. I told you what is megaspore? Megaspore is nothing but a ovule. So here you can see the deployed megaspore mother cell will undergo what? First meiotic division to form how many cells? Four daughter cells. So among the four daughter cells, three will degenerate. What do you mean by degeneration? That will become non-functional, right? And only only one megaspore will be functional, right? And this functional megaspore will undergo what? Mitotic division, first mitotic division to form how many cells? How many nuclei? Two, which will move to the opposite poles. Then you use the word called what? Two nucleate stage, right? And followed by repeated two more sequential mitotic division, which ultimately lead to the formation of four and ultimately to eight nucleate stage. Here you can see here eight nucleate, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Hope I am clear, two, two, four, four, two, eight. So this is how the sequential mitotic cell division will take place. Now what will happen to this eight nucleate stage? After the eight nucleate stage, the cell wall is formed and the cell wall is formed and it forms a typical embryo sac. You can see this is called as an embryo sac, a typical embryo sac within the ovule. And here in eight nucleate stage, you can find that only the six nuclei, the only the six uh, nuclei will have the cell wall formation, right? Only six will have the cell wall formation. So what will happen to the remaining two? The remaining two nuclei will go to the center and they are called as the polar nuclei, two polar nuclei. These are called two polar nuclei, I repeat. So this is called eight nucleate seven cell stage. This is called eight nucleate seven cell stage. Eight nucleate, it is called eight nucleate seven cell stage. Here you can see the eight nucleate. Among the eight nucleate only six cells will get the cell wall formation. Remaining two will move to the center and they are called as what? Center they are called as what? Two polar nuclei. So among the six three are towards the micropylar end and they consist of what we call it as egg apparatus. So three cells are grouped at the micropylar end and you call it as egg apparatus. What is this egg apparatus consisting of? This egg apparatus consists of very important one called egg, egg cell, the other one two called synergids. Hope I am clear, I will repeat. Among the eight nucleate, only six nucleate will have the cell wall formation and the two remaining two will move to the center which are called as two polar nuclei and three more cells will be grouped at what end? Micropylar end and they constitute an apparatus called what? Egg apparatus. What is this egg apparatus consisting of children? This egg apparatus consists of an egg, single egg and two synergids. So totally it is three cells. So the cells that are found in the micropylar end is three cells. And here you can see towards the chalagel region. This is called chalagel region. How many cells are there? Three cells are there. What do you call them as antipodal cells? So here three cells, here three cells and here two. So totally how many? How many nuclei? Eight nuclei and it is called this together forms one cell. So you call it as what? Eight nucleate, seven celled stage, right? Three move towards the micropylar end. Three cells 
are grouped toward the micropylar end and they are called as what? Egg apparatus. What is this egg apparatus consisting of? It is consisting of an egg and two synergids. And very important thing you have to learn here, particularly in this region where the two synergids are there, there is a cellular thickening which is called filiform apparatus. Here you can see this. So this is how a matured uh, embryo sac looks here. So here you can see the two synergids and this is the egg cell and these are the two synergids. So here you can see the egg cell and the two synergids and these two are the polar nuclei and these three are the antipodal cells. Here three cells, here three cells, here two, right? But we use a word called eight nucleate, seven cell stage. Right, here you can see this filiform apparatus. This filiform apparatus is very, very important. You can see here, and what is the role played by the filiform apparatus? It guides the pollen tube carrying the two male gametes and helps it to enter the synergids. Why it has to help the pollen tube to enter the synergids? What is found here? Here it is found is what? Egg cell. So one of the male gamete has to fuse with the egg cell right to form what zygote so this synergids have a very important cellular thickening which we use the word called filiform apparatus they might ask what is the function of filiform apparatus what is the function of filiform apparatus which is found near the synergis it will help or it will guide the pollen tube what is pollen tube pollen tube is carrying the male to male gametes and it will guide the pollen tube carrying the two male gametes to enter the synergids to enter the synergids and release what the two male gametes so one of the male gamete will fuse with the egg cell the other one male gamete is going to fuse with the two polar nuclei which is later going to become what we call it as endosperm which is a reserve food material for the developing zygote and this egg cell will form what zygote that is what we call it as what? Fertilization. Hope you have understood the whole process of megasporogenesis. I am going to explain once again. So what is megasporogenesis? It is the process of formation of a megaspore from a megaspore mother cell through meiosis is called megasporogenesis. So a diploid megaspore mother cell will undergo meiotic division to form how many cells? Four daughter cells. How many cells? Four daughter cells. Among the four daughter cells, three cells will degenerate the three cells will de degenerate and only one will be functional degenerate means what will which will become the three cells will become non functional and only this megaspore is functional and this functional megaspore will undergo first mitotic division to form two cells which move to the opposite pole so this is called two nucleate stage which will undergo this two nucleate stage will undergo repeated two more mitotic division to form what four nucleate stage then ultimately leads to what this is called eight nucleate stage hope you have understood the functional megaspore will undergo first mitotic division to form two nucleate stage then it will form what four nucleate then it will form eight nucleate among the eight nucleate only the six cells will get will have the cell wall formation around it and the tumor will go to the center which you call it as what polar nuclei so the two polar nuclei among the six three cells are grouped which move towards the micropylar end among the three one is called the egg cell and the other two are called as what synergids so here you can see that is two are synergids one is egg cell and these two are the polar nuclei. Three more move towards the chalagel end which are called as antipodals. Even the antipodals also will degenerate later. And I remember I told you about a very important uh, function of filiform apparatus. What is the function of filiform apparatus? This filiform apparatus will guide the pollen tube carrying the two male gametes to take an entry into the synergids. That is the pollen tube will form like this carrying the two male gametes and it will go and fuse with the egg cell. So here one of the male gamete fuses with the egg cell to form what? Zygote. And one more male gamete will fuse with the polar nuclei to form what? Endosperm. So this is a very very important concept from examination point of view. Hope you have understood what is megasporogenesis. 
Moving on to a next very important concept called pollination. What is pollination children? Pollination is nothing but the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of a flower. Just definition is pollination definition is what? Transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of a flower. And what are the different kinds of pollination? What are the different kinds of pollination? We have the two very important types. One is called cell pollination. The other one is cross pollination. And what is cell, cell pollination is also called as autogamy. Right, cross pollination is also called allogamy or it can also be called as xenogamy. What is cell pollination then? The transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of the same flower. Usually this is quite possible in bisexual flowers. What do you mean by bisexual flower? Already you have studied, right? Bisexual flower is a flower which contains both the male reproductive structure and the female reproductive structure in the same flower, right? What is cross pollination? Cross pollination is nothing but the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of another flower of different plant. But what is xenogamy? Xenogamy is nothing but what? There is one more word you have to understand. It is called getanogamy. Getanogamy. Getanogamy is a type of cross pollination as well as it is a type of autogamy. What do you mean by getanogamy? It is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of another flower but of the same plant. It is called getanogamy. So it is more or less like cross pollination but it is an autogamy. So the pollination which involves different species you call it as hybridization. So here one more term. So what are the conditions for autogamy? What are the conditions for autogamy? Particularly here the flowers have to maintain what we call synchrony. They have to maintain what we call it as synchrony. What is synchrony understanding? That is the anthers as well as particularly the chasmo in chasmogamous flowers, the anther and the stigma should be exposed but they should lie close together. They must be nearby to each other or close by to each other. Such a flower is called chasmogamous flower. What is chasmogamous flower? Flowers with post uh, anther and stigma, but they must lie close together. Then what is clistogamous flower? The flowers which do not open at all. So here you can give an example of comelina, you can give an example of oxalis or viola which is called common palsy. You can give those examples. And getanogamy I already told you. What is getanogamy? Getanogamy is nothing but where the transfer of pollen grains takes place from the anther of a flower to the stigma of not the same flower but another flower but of the same plant. It is called getanogamy. What is xenogamy? Xenogamy is nothing but the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of different flower of different plant. It is called xenogamy. So as I said, what is pollination? Pollination is nothing but the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of a flower. So based on the mode, we differentiate the pollination into two types, autogamy and xenogamy and there is one more called getanogamy. Autogamy as I said, what is very important is self-pollination and here how does it takes place? There must plants require what? Plants require synchrony that is pollen grain release as well as the uh, stigma receptivity should be at the same time. Then only the process of self pollination can take place. So here you can see the diagrammatic structure of a pollination, how the pollination takes place. Here you can see it is of the same flower or a but of different flowers. Here pollination takes place between the same flower. So one is what? Getanogamy, the other one is what? Pollen, a different flower. So this is autogamy and this is getanogamy, right? Moving on to the outbreeding devices. It is otherwise called contrivances for cross pollination. Children, one thing you should remember, plants prefer cross pollination than self pollination because seeds that are produced through cross pollination will have a better survival rate when compared to those seeds which are produced through self pollination. So the plants itself will come out with certain strategies to avoid self pollination, to avoid self pollination and to encourage cross pollination. So that devices which a plant will try to implement to avoid self-pollination and to encourage cross-pollination is called outbreeding devices. This is a very important concept from examination point of view. This is definitely asked in most of the question P board question papers. What is outbreeding devices? That is continued uh, self-pollination will lead to a very important uh, called inbreeding depression.
inbreeding depression this is a word which is asked in exam what is inbreeding depression continued self pollination will lead to inbreeding depression so the plants will not have that much of better survival rate right if continuous self pollination will take place so what will the plants adapt they will come out with certain devices or strategies to avoid self pollination and to encourage what cross pollination and we use the word called what outbreeding devices or contrivances for self pollination now let us study one by one what are the outbreeding devices so one is dicleni which is also called as unisexuality the other one is called self sterility or self incompatibility dicogamy and hercogamy now let us see what is this outbreeding devices what are outbreeding devices outbreeding devices are those which promote cross pollination because self pollination results in what inbreeding depression as i said continuous self pollination will lead to inbreeding depression so plants in order to avoid this inbreeding depression they will go on to this outbreeding devices they will start adapting these devices to avoid self pollination and to encourage cross pollination what is heterostyly one is one more called heterostyly different size of style and stamen so the length of the stamens will be at different levels so that they will not come in contact with each other so it is one mode of avoiding what self pollination so here you can see the length of here one flower here one flower the length of the see here you can see the stigma as well as the pollen grains so they are of at a different level so different size of style and stamens will avoid what will avoid the self pollination then hercogamy so they are nothing but what you call it as barriers the barriers which will prevent the falling of the pollen grains on the stigmatic surface so there might be many barriers uh, what you can call as hindrances which will stop uh, self pollination right so in order to avoid self pollination and that is called hercogamy an anatomical barrier like the anther and the stigma will come across so example is what calotropis self sterility so pollen grains do not germinate on stigma of the self flower suppose if at all uh, self pollination takes place but the pollens will fail to germinate what will happen if they germinate what is pollen germination formation of a pollen tube carrying two male gametes so that will be avoided even if it falls it will come across a phenomenon or a device called self sterility so because of this even if the pollens fall on the stigmatic surface they fail to germinate so you can say that stigma is not receptive it is not though it may receive is non receptive you can say right then protoandry and it is called as dicogamy what do you mean by di two gamy means what the reproductive organs so the androsium and the gynosium will mature at two different times what will happen if they mature at the same time if at all they mature at the same time the chances of self pollination is quite possible as i said the plant will avoid what self pollination and encourage what cross pollination so when both androsium and gynosium is going to mature at two different times obviously it is avoiding what it is avoiding self pollination and it is encouraging what it is encouraging cross pollination hercogamy already i told you what is hercogamy hercogamy is nothing but barriers and anatomical barriers which is going to prevent the pollen grains falling on the stigmatic surfaces so this is a very important concept for you all to learn which is asked in your pu board exam what what are the outbreeding devices which is asked for two marks also right or it might be asked for three marks so what are the outbreeding devices which are a uh, plant will uh, implement to avoid uh, self pollination and to enhance cross pollination one is dicleni that is formation of what unisexual flowers male is separate and female is if it is a bisexual flower obviously the chances of self pollination is quite possible so if at all if it is an unisexual flower definitely self pollination there is no possibility of self pollination to take place and definitely cross pollination is quite possible what do you mean by st self sterility as i said self sterility means what even the pollen grains fall on the stigmatic surface they fail to germinate dicogamy two different times of uh, maturation of the male and the female reproductive organ so androsium will mature at different time then it is called as protoandry and if anther matures prior to gynosium it is called protoandry and if gynosium matures prior to androsium it is called protogyny so that device is called as dicogamy and hercogamy as i have already told you it is nothing but the anatomical barriers which are implemented to avoid self pollination so these are the outbreeding devices a very very important concept from the examination point of view 
Moving on to the types of pollination. Here, as I said, pollination is nothing but the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of a flower. But as you know, the plants are stationary. They need some agents. And here, the agents of self-pollination, we classify them into two types. One is called as the biotic agents. The other one is called as abiotic agents. Biotic agents and abiotic agents. Hope you have understood what are agents. Agents are the ones which bring about the process of pollination. And these agents are classified into two, a, two types of agents. What are the two types of agents? One is called biotic. The very word itself will tell you living agents like the animals, the insects, bees, wasps, birds, all these are called as biotic agents. What do you mean by abiotic agent? Non-living. That is what? Namely here it is wind and water. We classify the agents which bring about the pollination into two types, biotic agents and abiotic agents. But we find that most of the angiosperm plants will come across biotic agents for their pollination than abiotic agents. So very few plants will opt for abiotic agents because the chances of pollen grains falling on the stigmatic surface is a chance factor. It may happen or it may not happen, particularly in wind and water pollination. Right. So in order to compensate the loss, more several number of pollen grains are produced than to the number of ovules. So ovules are less as I said, only one sometimes. I hear the pollen grains are more in number. Why? Why they are produced? Because all the pollen grains may not fall on the stigmatic surface and germination will take place. There is no guarantee. So that is the reason to compensate the loss of the pollen grains. What will the flower do? Will produce large number of pollen grains. So abiotic agents are namely the wind and water. Biotic agents are like we come across the animals, right? It might be the bee, it might be the wasp, moth, right? Or it might be the birds as well as it might be a bat or a snail also, right? Beetles, all these we call it as biotic agents. Now let us study one by one. I think here we can come across the first one called wind pollination. Here you can see this beautiful picture. Right. What is wind pollination otherwise called? Wind, wind pollination is otherwise called anemophily and the flower which is pollinated through wind is called anemophilous flower. Here the flowers, what should be the condition of the wind pollinated flowers? So wind pollinated flowers should have the following characteristic features. What is that light weight? The pollen grains should be light in weight. Why they should be light in weight? Then only they can be easily carried by the wind current. If they are heavy, they cannot be moved with the wind current. So what are the features of flowers which need to be pollinated through wind? Wind pollination is also called as what? Anemophily. So what are the features of the wind pollinated flowers? They should be lightweight. Right? They should be lightweight and they should produce what? Large number of pollen grains. Large number of pollen grains. Why they should produce large number of pollen grains? Because that it is a chance factor. The pollen grains may fall on the stigmatic surface or may not. So in order to compensate the loss, what has to happen? Large number of pollen grains have to be produced. And the pollen grains should be non-sticky. If they are sticky, then they, they cannot be easily carried by the wind current. But wind pollinated flowers may not produce the fragrance or may not be brightly colored because it is the agent that is bringing about the process of pollination is nothing but wind which is a abiotic agent. So there is no what we call it as benefit for the wind. So it is not going to ask for any rewards. So that is the reason why the wind pollinated flowers may not be brightly colored or may not produce the fragrance. But there are certain characteristic features of wind pollinated flowers and they should also have expanded anther expanded here you can see the expanded part so that they can come and fall on the so they should have an expand they can be easily carried expanded surface so that they can be easily carried by the wind so these are all the characteristic features of wind pollination that is um, so what are the, what do you mean by wind pollination? 
pollination that takes place through wind. Wind is what? It is a abiotic agent. And such flower which is pollinated through wind is called as what? Animophilus flower. Now what are the features of animophilus flower? They should be light in weight and they should produce large number of uh, pollen grains and the surface should be non-sticky and the, the expanded surface they should have so that it can be easily carried by the wind. Now moving across the second type called water pollination or, or it is called hydrophily. There it is called wind pollination or anemophily and pollination through water is called hydrophily. Right, as I said, most of the plants, angiosperm plants, you don't come across this water pollination or hydrophily, only around 30 genera of species will come across such type of hydrophily. And pol water pollination or hydrophily is very rare in plants. So you can study, you can take the examples of two plants. One is called hydrophytic plants, you can call it as Vallisneria and Joestra. Right, here you can see in this picture, beautiful picture. So what is the mechanism that is involved in the water pollination in case of Vallisneria then? Here you can see the female flowers will produce a long stalk. Here you can see the female flask produces a long stalk so that it will come on the surface of the water. Here what is the medium? Here the medium is water. Water is a abiotic medium, right? So the female flower will produce a long stalk so that the female flask will come on the, will start floating on the surface of the water. And at the same time, the male flower will release the pollen grains and they will float along with the water current. Here you can see along with the water current and come and fall on the stigmatic surface. As I said, this is the female flower which produces a long stalk. Here you can see the long stalk. So what is the stalk helping the flower so that the female flower can reach the surface of the water, right? So it is reaching the surface of the water. So what will happen? The male flower will shed the pollen grains on the surface of the water and they will come in contact with what? They will come in contact with the stigmatic surface of the female flower. Here you can see the diagram. They will come in contact with the female flower and the fusion will take place. So that is the mechanism uh, which is taking place in Vallis Neria, which is a uh, aquatic plants. So water pollination or hydrophily, you can take two examples. One example is Vallis Neria and the second example is Joestra. You can see a lot of difference between these two plants. In Vallis Neria, as I said, the female flower produces a long stalk and comes to the surface of the water. And the male flower releases the pollen grains and the pollen grains are flown along with the water current that is they pass through the water current and come in contact with the stigmatic surface of the female flower and the fusion will take place fertilization will take place but in joestra it is a different case the female flowers remain submerged in water under uh, inside the water here it is above the water the process of uh, pollination is happening above the surface of the water here it is happening in joestra it is inside the water that is the female flower is inside the water submerged in water and the male flower also will release the pollen grains inside the water and the process of fusion of the gametes will happen inside the water here it is outside on the surface of the water not outside means surface of the water here it is inside the water this is a very very important mechanism mechanism of pollination which takes place in Vallisneria and Joestra. Joestra is also called as seagrass. It is also called as seagrass, right? This is a very, very important concept which is asked in the examination, right? So what is the mechanism involved in the process of uh, pollination in Vallisneria or they might ask in Joestra. So what are the two very important examples for water pollination or hydro, what is water pollination? Uh, what are the two very important abiotic agents which bring about the process of pollination? One is wind and the other one is what? Water. What do you call the pollination through wind as? Anemophily. What do you call that flower which is pollinated through wind as? Anemophilus. Anemophilus flower. And what is that mode which is uh, pollinated through water called? It is called hydrophily. So one is wind is the agent, the other one is the water. Do you think all the plants will opt for these two abiotic agents? No, very few plants will opt. Why? Because it is a chance factor. The pollen grains may fall on the stigmatic surface or may not fall on the stigmatic surface and fertilization may, not, may take place or may not take place. So that is the reason most of the plants will not opt for wind or water. And already we have discussed about the nature of the wind and the water pollinator. 
And uh, we have studied about the mechanism of uh, water pollination in Vallisneria and the mechanism of water pollination in Joyestra. Hope you have understood what is pollination, what are the kinds of pollination, and what are the agents which bring about the process of pollination. As we said, the agents are classified into two types. What are they? Biotic agents and abiotic agents. What do you mean by biotic? Living, living organisms bring about the process of pollination. Here, non-living agents bring about the process of pollination, namely wind and water. Right. Moving on to the next, that is pollination by animals. Pollination by animals is also called as zoophily. Zoo means what animals? Pollination through Wind is called anemophily. Pollination through water is called hydrophily. Pollination by animals is called zoophily. So, as I said in the beginning of this uh, concept called pollination, so usually it may take place by means of insects. It is called entomophily. That is pollination by means of insects is called entomophily. And pollination by means of birds is called ornithophily. And even bats, as you know, bats are nocturnal animals. They also bring about the process of pollination in the night. And the pollination by means of uh, bats is called chiropterophily. Here entomophily, ornithophily and also by snails called malcophily. There is one more children which is called myrmicophily. Myrmicophily means what? Pollination by means of ants. Ants as they crawl also bring about the process of pollination. So all these concepts are very important for you all to crack the competitive exams like NEET exam. So every concept what you study in biology is very, very important for you all to go through the competitive exams like NEET. So all this is asked even in your NEET exam. So what do you call that? means of pollination by ants, it is called myrmicophily. And I think already I all told you, even beetles, even beetles also act as a means of, means for pollination. And that process is called, pollination by beetles is called cantherophily. So here you can see, pollination brought about by bees, butterflies, wasp, moth, beetles, flies, birds, bats, wind and even we as human beings also bring about the process of pollination. How like when you touch a flower and you go and touch another flower. So unknowingly we also bring about the process of pollination, right? So what do you call the pollination by insects as entomophily? What do you call the pollination by means of birds? By means of birds as ornithophily. What do you, what do you call pollination by means of bats as we call it as chiropterophily. What do you call pollination by snails? Malcophily. What do you call the pollination by means of ants? Myrmicophily. What do you call the means of pollination by means of beetles? Here you can see beetles. It is cantherophily. Now, 80% of the flowers are pollinated through insects. So insects play a very great role in bringing about a very important process called pollination. Because as you know, the, what is the reward for the insect? Simply it doesn't go to a flower. What is the reward? The reward is the nectar. For birds, what is the reward? The reward is what? Pollen grain. Without any rewards, nobody will do any job as you know, right? Right, so as I said, 80% of the Flowers are pollinated through insects, that is due to bees. So what is the reward for a bee? Why will a bee go to a flower? And particularly what should be the nature of the flowers which are pollinated through uh, animals? Usually the flowers should be brightly colored and they should have attractive colors. They should be brightly and attractive colors and they should be more attractive. Then only an uh, insect will be attracted towards the flower. If not, it will not go to a flower. So it should be brightly colored and more attractive. And even the pollen grains should be sticky. Why? Because so that it can stick to the legs of the insects and then it goes and when it dusts its body, unknowingly it may fall on the stigmatic surface of a flower. So when it goes to a flower, why does it go to a flower? Why does it go to a flower? To suck the sweet of a flower called nectar. Right, birds go to a flower for what? To eat the pollen grains. So knowingly or unknowingly it is helping in the process of pollination. Right, now you can take one more example like the moth and a yucca plant. Like for example, some as I said, without any reward they will not do the job of pollination. So some, uh, particularly like some moth, in order to lay eggs, 
they visit, particularly we'll take one example, uh, the relationship between a moth and a yucca plant. Moth and yucca plant. What is, the, you might wonder, what is the relationship between the moth and the yucca plant? The moth visits this yucca plant to lay eggs. So it feels that it is a safe place for the moth to lay eggs inside the yucca flower. And at the same time, what is the benefit for the yucca plant? The process of pollination will take place. So both are benefited. How is the moth benefited? The moth is benefited by laying the eggs inside the flower and it is the safest place for the moth to lay the eggs. So there is no any damage or any predators causing damage to the eggs. So that is the reason the moth will come and lay eggs on inside the yucca flower. How is the yucca flower benefited? The yucca flower is benefited by the flower will get pollinated. So usually the, without any rewards the insects or even the moth or you can say even the plants also will not carry on this process called pollination. So most of the flowers are pollinated through insects, 80% you can say. So what are the adaptations to attract insects? As I said, color, color of the, I think all of us now you have seen in the previous uh, session how beautiful the flowers are. As you know, flower is a reproductive structure of a plant body and it is a modified shoot meant for sexual reproduction. So you can see different colored flowers and how beautiful aesthetic value what we get when we see a beautiful flower, the happiness what we get by seeing a flower. So the flowers are multicolored and many and you can see the various colors of the petals of the flowers and what is the why the flowers are brightly colored to attract the insects, to attract the insects for what? For pollination and scent, the perfume, the sweet smell that is coming from the flower will also attract the insects but sometimes like I think I do need to mention about beetle. So the flowers which are uh, pollinated through beetle will not produce sweet scent instead it will produce what bad odor, bad odor. What do you mean by odor? Smell and they are attracted by the bad smell so, right here some insects are attracted by the sweet smell but there like for example in beetles they are attracted by the bad odor and that is how the process of pollination will take place. And another thing as I said the edible, edible pollen, nectar, the sweet of a flower and even the edible pollen all these are the rewards for the insects to visit a flower. Hope you have understood the concepts what we have studied in today's session. So what did we study in today's session children? We studied about the Gynosium, as you know, gynosium is nothing but a female reproductive structure of a flower which consists of style, stigma and what? Ovary. So what is stigma? The expiry, you can call it as stigma as a landing platform for the pollen grains to land. And you can see the slender stalk that is called the style through which the pollen tube grows. And you can see the bulged part that is the ovary. And this ovary uh, is a hollow structure which consists of ovarian cavities called locules, right? And all of you know the ovule is attached to the ovary by means of a fertile tissue called placenta. And the mode of arrangement of the ovules in an ovary is called placentation. And what does an ovary produce? Ovary is nothing but going to produce a megaspore. Megaspore is nothing but a ovule. And you already studied about the structure of a ovule, right? And we also studied about a very important process called megasporogenesis. There in androgen we studied about microsporogenesis. Here we study about megasporogenesis. Then we moved on to the outbreeding devices. What are outbreeding devices? As we have learned that the plants will try to avoid self pollination to avoid inbreeding depression and will encourage what cross pollination how do they avoid self pollination and encourage cross pollination by implementing certain devices or certain strategies to avoid self pollination and to enhance cross pollination we use the word called outbreeding devices then we studied about pollination what is pollination pollination is nothing but the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of a flower based on that maybe the same flower or different flower we came across the types of uh, pollination like autogamy, then xenogamy and gitanogamy. Then we moved on to the agents 
of pollination. What was the classification of the agents of which bring about the process of pollination? We classified them into two agents that is the biotic agents and the abiotic agents. What do you mean by biotic agents? The living agents, maybe it might be the birds, moth or the butterfly, bees, uh, uh, that is bat, all these are called as biotic agents. What do you mean by abiotic agent? That is a non-living agents like the wind and water, right? Uh, all this we have studied in today's session. Now what are we going to study in the coming session of the same chapter called sexual reproduction in flowering plants. As I said, this chapter 2 of your syllabus called sexual reproduction in flowering plants is a very, very important chapter which carries a weightage of 8 marks and all the diagrams and the concepts what you study in this chapter is very, very important. Hope uh, you have understood all the concepts what I have explained in today's session and moving on to the next session in the coming sessions what am I going to teach you all? I am going to teach you all about a very important concept called pollen pistol interaction. Once the pollen falls on the stigmatic surface what are the changes that is going to happen. Then very important concept called artificial hybridization which is quite commonly used for the breeding programs. So this is also a very important concept which I am going to cover in the coming session. Then a very important process called double fertilization or it is called double fertilization triple fusion. So once the pollen tube carries the male gametes and one of the male gamete fuses with the egg cell to form a zygote. The other male gamete fuses with the polar nuclei to form an endosperm nucleus. So all that process we use the word called double fertilization. So till then, goodbye and thank you.